Good morning to you. Good morning. I hope you're well. It's a glorious, sunny Sunday morning here in South Manchester. It is lovely outside as we approach 11 a.m. UK time as this goes out live on Fab Radio 2, tune in radio, richieallen.co.uk and triggerwarning.tv. It's obviously Sunday View. I'll be taking a look over the front pages of the Sunday newspapers and some of the stories contained inside those papers as well. You can tweet me at any time, of course. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Tweet me. Let me know what you're thinking about these stories. Hope you're in fine fettle and your weekend has been going swimmingly for you. Let's do Sunday View. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Yeah, I've had a good weekend thus far myself. I can't complain. It's been relaxing. It's been nice. This is Sunday View then. Join in at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Let's have a look at some of the big stories of the day. Good to be with you. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, you're reporting good weather right across the UK anyway. Good morning to Samantha Jordan. Good morning, Samantha. John Smith is in Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland, and it's gorgeous there as well. Martin is in Spain. It's chemtrails there, says Martin. Sorry to hear that, Martin, but it'll be that way here tomorrow, no doubt. Good morning to Catherine and to everybody else who's joining me this morning. And before we go any further, spare a thought for long-time listener and long-time supporter of The Richie Allen Show, my old pal Alan Bristow. Alan is in a hospital in Grimsby this weekend. He's not well. He's got a blocked small intestine and he has tubes in his nose and tubes in his wee man, which can't be comfortable. So Alan, sincere best wishes, mate, and loads of love. And with the help of Gaia, God, whatever, whoever your God is, I hope you're out very soon, mate. I hope this cheers you up. Anyway, thanks for getting in touch this morning there. Alan, keep Alan Bristow in your thoughts. Right, let's have a look at the... So, no, before we have a look at the Sunday Express, we're going to kick off with the Sunday Express today. A couple of stories that are not in the papers, but they are doing the rounds of the television and radio shows this morning. One of them is this alleged terror, terror attack. They've got us speaking like idiots, don't they? Using this rubbish language. Terror attack. Apparently a man from Chechnya stabbed somebody to death in Paris and injured other people as well. This was in the Opera district. He was shot dead by police who tried to tase him as the tasers didn't work. Presumably Clouseau, Inspector Clouseau forgot to put them on charge so they just shot the guy to death. Right. And this has been declared a terrorist attack and... They're all over this, the media. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, took the script from his back pocket that every president, prime minister has for one of these attacks. The script that goes, they will never defeat our freedoms. They hate our values. They will never win. Whatever any of that means. The media says the Islamic State has claimed responsibility for it. They would, wouldn't they? I mean, if somebody kills somebody with a knife in a major European capital city, you might as well claim you were behind it. The media will lap it up and will report it without any investigation of it. Right. And this has made me giggle a lot this morning. This programme does delve into the realms of the conspiratorial from time to time, dear listener. (laughs) So I have been amused at how many of our listeners have suggested foul play in the Eurovision Song Contest. Now, uh, an Israeli woman called Netta won the Eurovision Song Contest for Israel, undoubtedly, her being Israeli. And I don't watch it. Uh, The the truth, I haven't watched it for 20 years. I I can't bear it. Terry Wogan's commentary on BBC television was worth watching it for many, many years ago. But anyway, apparently this woman's song was utter garbage. Now, 
to say that about Eurovision songs isn't saying much anyway. But apparently this was particularly shit. Not only that, but it had elements of the Me Too movement about it. That was the theme of the song. It was rubbish. But because the Eurovision votes now are done electronically, where everybody in Europe watching it can vote in their country, people have been suggesting that the Israelis, who are pretty smart when it comes now to the old cyber hacking, that maybe the Israelis had something to do with it. That just makes me giggle. I don't know anything about any of that. I spend an awful lot of time criticising Israel for the shit that it does do on this programme. I can't be making suggestions that I can't back up. But I'm thinking of Faisal, long-time listener to this programme who watched it. <laughs> right? Poor old Israel. Do you know there are Israelis who listen to this programme and they do contact me and they do say, Richie, if somebody slips over a banana skin, Israel gets blamed for it. So fair enough, right. Good morning to Base Ninja to David Stanford. Um, right, right, let's crack on, crack on. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a lot to get through. And I tell you, the first story is no laughing matter at all. It's the Sunday Express newspaper. By the way, I took the liberty early this AM to put the front pages of the newspapers on richieallen.co.uk. So if you want to see them, while you're listening to me, you can see them. You can see them while you're listening. This is some story. This elderly will be cared for by robots. And it was written by Lucy Johnston, who's um, a reporter with the Sunday Express. And the story goes like this. Robots which can listen, learn and react to people are being introduced in care homes to help look after residents and to prevent loneliness. The humanoid companions, which are equipped with artificial intelligence, will be able to recognise the needs and emotions of frail elderly residents. They will take the strain off of overburdened care workers, and as they get to know their charges, um, they will adapt to their conversations. Right? A two and a half million pound funded trial in partnership with the University of Bedfordshire and Advinia Healthcare, one of the UK's largest care providers, will be launched in September. Dr Chris Papadopoulos is the principal lecturer in health uh, at the University of Bedfordshire, Bedfordshire, and he said these robots can adapt, learn and tailor their conversations according to what they find out about an individual, just like two people would do in a normal conversation. They can learn about a person's cultural background and values and adjust to this too. He said the software is groundbreaking. We want to explore to what extent they might prevent loneliness and isolation, improve mental health and reduce family caregiver stress. Is it stressful to care for a loved one in their later years? All right, it might be tiring. Is it stressful? I don't know. Anyway, this idea has appalled a lot of people, including Judy Downey of the Relatives and Residents Association charity. She said, Judy Downey said, this is treating people like commodities. The key to looking after someone is having a relationship in which you might notice if someone is upset after a phone call or if they look unwell. What matters is the smile, is the human touch. The robots are four feet tall, they're called Pepper and were designed by SoftBank Robotics in Japan. And the artificial intelligence is called Caresses. The robots have a tablet on their chests, which residents can use to Skype call people, play games, videos or music, or remind them when to take their medication. Now, this is being reported in the Sunday Express today as if it's new news. It isn't new. The BBC reported on this last year. They went to see, the BBC sent a camera crew to visit Bill. Now, Bill is an 83-year-old gentleman whose wife died in 2010. And I'm not going to play you all of this because it's very long. But Bill spoke very eloquently and very poignantly about how difficult it is when your best friend, your soulmate, your life partner dies and you have to cope without her, right? So they sent a robot to him, one of these peppers. 
So you'll hear Bill speaking with the robot, then you'll hear Dr. Joe Saunders. And Dr. Joe Saunders is involved in the trial, right? So you'll hear Bill speaking with Pepper, and then you'll hear the doctor. Have a listen, let me know what you think. Hello, Pepper. Hello. 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 Oh, dear. We could do this forever. Oh, no, we could. <laughs> the elderly population is growing. It's a real problem. And there's not enough young people to actually support that, that elderly population. So there's this demographic time bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to dance with me? What dance? Oh, okay. I'll dance alone. No. <laughs> the robot is dancing around now to the song Greased Lightning in front of Bill. It's ridiculous. I will post a link to the clip later. Bill's taking to her. So I think there's potential if we could get them to talk properly with us, then it could be a great companion for people. What else do you do? The robot can appear in many ways to be empathic and be um, helpful. And it could well be they could form a relationship with an empathic robot. But of course the robot doesn't form any relationship with them because it's just a machine. Yes, the robot doesn't form any relationship with them. Isn't this absolutely disgusting, isn't it? And I was thinking this morning, and there's no virtue signalling here, is that how we see old people now? Do we see old people as fucking eejits? Eejits that we can humiliate by getting them to talk to a machine? Kill me now, I would say. Kill me now. You have to see this to believe it. The humiliation for somebody who's worked all their lives, who's contributed all their lives to be told a clunky looking, ridiculous looking robot is going to dance around in front of you, play music, and is going to have inane conversations, never forming a relationship with you. Is that really how we see old people? Is that what we want to do to senior citizens who are on their own? And he mentioned in the report there, you know, people coming through and funding and all of that. That's what it's all about. That's what it comes down to. You are considered a useless eater when you are no longer getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going out uh, into the system, into the heart of the matrix and doing what you're told to do, which is work yourself to the bone, pay shitloads of what you earn in taxes and barely hang on for 50 years. And when you're not doing that, you are a useless eater. You're nothing. You're a non-entity. So we can send robots to old people to humiliate them and make them feel stupid, and that's a way of replacing care, uh, vital care that they need in their homes, instead of training people, instead of training people to properly care for people, to pay them properly, to supervise them. Crazy story. It really is. The implications of it are absolutely terrifying. Also in the Sunday Express today, um, a story about mental health. Mental health. Bank of England governor backed crusade to end stigma. Uh, and this is about Mervyn King. Uh, he's made an impassioned plea to end the stigma around mental health. He's given exclusive commentary to the Sunday Express and he has implored businesses to support people with illnesses like depression or bipolar disorder to create a climate in which people can speak openly and get help. Carney actually says that mental illness has a devastating impact on the economy, not just on your friends and your family. And he says, by getting involved early, early intervention. Do you love that word, intervention? What's going to happen now? Are employers going to be intervening in terms of interfering in the lives of their employees. Oh, you don't look right. You're going to have to go and see somebody. You're going to have to get a prescription. Crazy. This is Mervyn King. He says the UK loses about 140 billion every year from lost output, fewer productive hours, and the cost of benefits and treatments and all of that. Drug them. Give them happy pills. Get them back to being good worker bees. Good worker drones. Not to mention, most people are pissed off 
for, for, for very good reasons. It's not mental health issues. They're pissed off because the world is a lunatic asylum. And on foot of that, or on the back of that, Carney talking about mental health, there has been multiple stories this weekend about a mental health crisis in students. Students need an intervention too. According to the BBC, British universities say they risk failing a generation unless students get better mental health care. A Universities UK report found that students risked slipping through the gaps due to a lack of coordination between the NHS and universities. The most up-to-date statistics show 146 students killed themselves in 2016 and at Bristol University, three, three students have died suddenly in the last month alone. NHS collaborating with universities, eh? Universities UK said that over the past five years, 94% of universities had seen a sharp increase in the number of people trying to access support services. Some institutions said there was a threefold increase. We have to radically change things said Professor Steve West. If we ignore this, we will have failed a generation. Drug them all. Medicate them all. We will be setting ourselves up for huge costs and burdens on the NHS. So to prevent future burdens on the NHS, we're going to have to intervene. And when somebody is showing signs of mental illness, not when somebody has asked for help, but when we have noticed that somebody looks like they're a little bit out of sorts, they're not cooperating maybe, they're not behaving normally, or normal as we've described it, well, we better intervene. Drug them all. And why are so many students depressed? Well, I've talked a lot about this over the last three years. And one of the issues, and this is ser so serious, this, one of the issues, it's just one issue, and I'm no expert, of course. I certainly have no area. I'm not an expert in mental health or in depression or counselling or, or anything like that. But here's one of the issues that's major. Nobody wants to talk about this in mainstream media. Dopamine levels. Dopamine levels. Our dopamine levels are all over the place because of one thing and one thing only. Our addiction to our phones. You know, the, the, the biggest manufacturers of smartphones in the world, Apple and Samsung, they acknowledge, wait for this, they acknowledge that we swipe our smartphones individually now more than two and a half thousand times a day on average. The majority of us don't give a shite where we're doing it. In front of the children, we could be out having meetings, we could be at the dinner table, it could be at a time when we should be asleep. 2,500 plus times a day people are swiping these things. Why? Because, as was discussed on this programme before, we get a trill from what we are addicted to. Dopamine. If you've never heard of dopamine, it's a chemical in the brain that makes us happy. And every time, for example, if you're using a phone... You get a text, you get a little burst of dopamine because you can't wait to see who it is. Is it something interesting? Was my Facebook picture liked? The tweet that I put out, was it retweeted? So keep checking the phones, keep checking the phones, keep checking the phones. What's the problem with that? Well, there is a downside to that. It makes people depressed. It makes people fed up. It makes people morose. Sick and tired of everything. Makes people find it difficult to relate to people. It makes it impossible for people to stay in the now. The present, the here and the now. Massive and nobody wants to talk about it. And I did a bit of research this morning. I didn't see this before. But 60 Minutes is a big news programme in America. CBS I think. And last year California University people, professors presumably connected electrodes to Anderson Cooper's fingers. Now, Anderson Cooper is a big television news anchor. And they wanted to measure changes in his heart rate and in his perspiration. Now, they, they had done this with other people as well, right? There was a big focus group. So then they moved his phone away from him 
and he observed him for a while and they sent him text messages. And what happened? His breathing changed, his perspiration increased and his heart rate spiked with each notification. I didn't know this until this morning. Textbook anxiety. Textbook. Right? And those highs are followed by lows. Depression. That's why 94% increase in students reporting depression. Because it is an empty high. Dopamine for text messages and who liked my Twitter uh, my status? Who liked my picture? My selfie? Eventually there has to be a down and the downs are massive. Sleep deprivation. Anxiety. The biggest danger to your health and your state of well-being, your mental health, is your smartphone. It's literally killing you. Get fucking rid of it if you can. Or only turn it on to make a call. When you don't want to make a call, turn it off. Delete the apps. Facebook, Twitter, the rest of it. Get rid of them. Speak to real people. Fuck it, we're surrounded by real people. Carlin and myself went to Clayton Vale yesterday. East Manchester, that's lovely. Beautiful country park, wonderful. Got the jazz with us, the jazz woman, brought her to the river, the Medlock River, threw her in, marvellous, it was lovely and warm, the dog was splashing around. I swear to God, and only because I was nervous that somebody might report me, I was going to take a picture of a very young boy sitting on a stone near the river, glued to his phone, glued to it. There's a river, there's trees, there was a, a rope and a tyre that you could swing on. There were dogs going mad, chasing sticks in the river. And the child is looking at a phone. Honest to Christ. I said to Caroline, how long is he going to be? He was there for 15, 20 minutes. He didn't budge. Hunched over. A little boy. Click, 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 click. What the fuck was he doing? Honestly. That's where your mental health problems are coming from. Your smartphones. Anyway, a bit passionate about that one, yeah, maybe a bit too passionate. 22 minutes past the hour. The Mail on Sunday, front page is about the royal wedding. <laughs> Get used to that, folks, this week. We should all take a break this week. Maybe I took the wrong week for my holiday. Don't worry, I will be with you every day this week and every other day, except for weekends right up until the end of August. Should have taken a holiday this week. Um, the front page is Megan's dad staged photos with the paparazzi. Megan's father. Looks like an ordinary bloke. Canadian, I think. He worked with photographers to stage a series of pictures. Apparently he got paid a hundred grand. Good for him. Well done, son. Also in the Royal... Also in the Mail on Sunday, moving away from the Royal family. Very interesting joke. This my friend and colleague... My compatriot, Jean Ann Crowley, will be very interested in this. This is some story, this. Here's the headline. Apologise for a joke. Knickers to that. Academic in the firing line for ladies' lingerie lift quip. Blasts attack on free speech amid frivolous sexism row. That's about the worst headline the male have ever come up with. What does it mean? What's the story? Well, here you go. This guy is a scientist. His name is Richard Ned Lebo. And he was at a convention in San Francisco last month. And he was in the lift. And the lift was packed. And we all know what it's like to be in a packed lift. Loads of people there. Everybody pressing the flesh or squeezed up against people. And he was at the back of the lift. So obviously the lift was moving and it was stopping at floors. So somebody at the front of the lift said... What floors would you like people at the back? And Professor Lebo said, Ladies lingerie, please. Cheerfully, ladies lingerie. Got a few laughs in the lift, but as the lift came to a stop, floor by floor, people left. One of the lift dwellers was, one of the lift travellers was very unhappy. A woman called Simona Sharoni, a professor of women's and gender studies. Did she speak to Professor Lebo? No, she didn't, but she went to report him. She was too shaken to confront him. She was shaken. These are her words now. Simona Sharoni. She's a professor of women's and gender studies. She was horrified by him saying, ladies' lingerie, please. 
So she complained him for harassment to the International Studies Association, who had organised the conference they were all there to participate in. They've upheld the complaint. They said the ISA that Professor Lebo violated its code and they ruled that he compounded his crime by dismissing her complaint as frivolous. He's been given until this Tuesday to apologise, but he is standing resolutely firm. He says it violates his freedom of speech. He likens it to book burning by the Nazis in the 1930s. I'm not apologising, he said, because I haven't done anything wrong. What sort of Egypt goes and complains a guy to an academic institution because he said, ladies, lingerie, please? What sort of fuckwit is shaken so badly that she can't say to me, Professor, come on, enough of the smutty jokes, eh? Not that there was anything smutty about it to begin with. No. No, she has to report him. I was offended. Not played this for a bit. I'm not going to play the whole clip. Bit of Steve Hughes for you. And then we have political correctness, which is, which is this joy that is the other side of health and safety, which is health and safety, which is a small oppression of our physical movement, so we can't do anything without permission from the state. And political correctness is the oppression of our intellectual movement, so no one says anything anymore in case somebody else gets offended. <laughs> what happens if you say that and someone gets offended? <laughs> well, they can be offended. <laughs> What's wrong with being offended? When did sticks and stones made break my bones stop being relevant? <laughs> Isn't that what you teach children, for God's sake? That's what you teach toddlers. He called me an idiot. Don't worry about him. He's a dick. <laughs> now you have adults going, I was offended. I was offended and I have rights. <laughs> well, so what? Be offended. Nothing happens. <laughs> You're an adult. Grow up. Deal with it. I was offended. I don't care. <laughs> nothing happens when you're offended. There's nothing. I, I went to the comedy show and, and the comedian said something about the Lord and, and I was offended. And when I woke up in the morning, I had leprosy. <laughs> nothing happens. I want to live in democracy, but I never want to be offended again. <laughs> well, you're an idiot. <laughs> a law about offending people? How do you make it an offence to offend people? Being offended is subjective. That has everything to do with you as an individual or a collective or a group or a society or a community, your moral conditioning, your religious beliefs. What offends me may not offend you. And you want to make laws about this? I'm offended when I see boy bands, for God's sake. It's <laughs> a valid offence. I'm offended. Well, it is. If you're going to have an offence culture, you, of course you could say... Well, I'm offended by boy bands. That's the logical conclusion of it. You have to guarantee my right to go through life without ever being confronted by a boy band. That's how mad it's become. It's lunacy. Dean Smith tweets, I think I found a new business. I think there could be a fortune to be made by selling backbones. Uh, These are the damned, tweets. My internet went down last week only for an hour and my son was climbing the walls. My answer to him was, read a book. But then he looked at me like I was crazy. They are glued to their phones and tablets. Uh, Hi to Cartoon Drunk to James Gates. James says, but I listen to the show through my phone. But that's all right, James, because the phone then becomes like a transistor, doesn't it? Like an old radio. But you're not sitting there. Presumably, James, you're not constantly sitting there with your phone, constantly checking your Facebook status and your Twitter status to see who's liked you. That's a different thing. Use the phone to listen to the show, but put the phone down and listen to it, or any other show for that matter. But um, anyway, Omari, good morning. Richie, you're spot on. The phones are evil. Great analysis. If you get deeper into it, you could argue that it's actually taking away our consciousness. It is. Well, to be fair to David Icke, um, who I've not mentioned for a while, David talked about the impact that phones are having in terms of they are taking people we are we are already one step away from reality if this is a holographic universe if this is a dream world so we're already one step away he argues that these devices are moving us another step back from 
the reality, which is kept hidden uh, from us there. David tweets, will Richie be tuning into the royal wedding next Saturday? Will he choose BBC or Sky to enjoy this worldwide occasion? I think I will be out all day next week enjoying the weather, whatever it is, with the future Mrs. Allen, who's away the following week. So I'll be making much of my time with her next weekend. She's off to France the week after. I certainly won't be watching the wedding. I'll watch the cup final next Saturday, but that's about it. Cliff Moore says, Richie, Eurovision, I saw the demonstrator whip the mic from the UK singer's hands. I was hoping it would break into a bit of Shaz and Dave rather than the shit that was being sung. Excellent, Cliff. (laughs) Well, I don't want to be made to look a fool no more. What do you take me for, oh darling? Great song that, there ain't no pleasing you, Shaz and Dave. Feathers and wings, I don't have a smartphone, I hate them. Old fashioned thing I have, is it doesn't do the internet, my phone just calls and sends texts. Good stuff, mate. Right, quick break, back with more from the papers after these. This is your Sunday View, live on richieallen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2, TriggerWarning.tv and Tune In Radio. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Yes, and I've just put a song in your head that will not go away all day. Shaz and Dave, there ain't no pleasing you. Oh, darling, there ain't no pleasing you. It'll be in your head all day. Right, let's move on. I I think we've done two papers, have we? Mother of God, let's crack on, right? Where are we? The Observer. This is funny. One million students... Join calls for vote on Brexit deal. That's the front page of the Observer. One million students join calls for vote on Brexit deal. Right, this is bullshit or monumental bollocks because the headline is not supported by the text of the story. One million students, that's seismic, that's massive, but it's not true. Student organisations representing 980,000 university students are demanding a referendum on any final Brexit deal. You see, that's the truth of it. It's just a handful of organisations who claim to represent nearly a million students. So it's boulder dash, boulder dash on the front page of The Observer. It's ludicrous to claim that their entire body of membership, students all over the country, are anti-Brexit. This is a claim uh, made by Kerry Dingle. Kerry Dingle is good. She says it's ludicrous for them to claim that all students think like this. Here's Kerry Dingle. 
on Sky News today. Oh, I do think this is a shame. It says here, you know, a million students are joining calls for vote on a Brexit deal. And it, first of all, it's not quite true. This is student mm. organisations and student le leaders claiming they represent a million students demanding uh, a re-vote on Brexit um, before the final deal. A, I don't think that's true of the entire student population. No, 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 or of no. all young people. So I don't think that's a legitimate claim. And secondly, there's, if you read a lot of the articles on this, there's more than a whiff of ageism. You know, this idea that older people have all been terribly evil and racist and horrid and xenophobic and voted for breakfast. Bre bre breakfast? <laughs> breakfast would be a good thing. <laughs> voted for Brexit. Whereas, you know, young people are supposedly so radical they all voted Remain. And they're worried now that there are these young people who haven't had a chance to vote yet who will be old enough by the time they go to university in the fall. And I, I just think it's very sad that, A, this is really not good for young people. It's pushing this entitlement culture yes. that, you know, you haven't, you've had such a terrible time and these old people have done a terrible thing to you, rather than thinking, well, actually, the call for, for, to vote remain by young people, which has mostly been about rail cards, student exchange programmes and your research grant yeah. is not some great blow for democracy or sovereignty. And older people who, like me, who voted for Brexit, actually might have the interests of young people all over Europe at heart in that we want to have more control over our lives. Well said, Kerry Dingle. Good stuff. Well done. Also in The Observer today, former Labour leader and Europhile Neil Kinnock has claimed that Jeremy Corbyn will commit a serious evasion of duty if he doesn't change course and back the UK staying in the single market. In a strongly worded attack, Kinnock signalled that Labour MPs should defy Corbyn if he repeats instructions to abstain in parliamentary votes on Britain staying in the European Economic Area. Don't panic, I'm not going to spend too much more time on Brexit, but it is dominating the papers today, as it has done for nearly two years now. Now, Sky News had a couple of student union folks on their breakfast show. One of them is a, a young woman called Amanda Chetwin Cowieson. She's all in favour of another referendum. You'll hear her first. And you'll also hear Tom Harwood, who's a prominent student campaigner for vote leave. This was Sky this morning. Yes, so the signatures <coughs> of this letter are elected representatives. Uh, they're very clearly there to represent the best interest of their members and they have all very much signed up to the fact that they think their members are going to be better served by having a people's vote on the terms of the Brexit deal. Uh, they have a mandate to do this. Many of them have pro-Remain policy at their unions and they read the letter, they've very, very, taken very seriously what it says and they all feel that their members are going to be served best with the membership benefits that we get from the European Union. What's the turnout at a, at a, a student union election? It varies wildly across the country. I mean, yeah. when I was elected as SU president, it was about 50%, so higher than local elections, for example. And I also think we need to not get into this argument of what was the turnout. Oh, let's, let's get into that argument, Amanda. Let's get into that argument because snowflakes like you and your pals have been bitching about the referendum results since day one. And one of the great bitches of all time is the notion that the turnout wasn't so high and lots of people didn't vote that means they didn't really vote for brexit but it's okay when you're running for student union president if only half the fucking students turn up that election is valid isn't it isn't it Great stuff by Stephen Dixon on Sky this morning. Good man, Stephen. Burnout, because then we get into the argument of local councils. Yeah, but that's interesting, MPs. though, isn't it? Because in terms of, of the Brexit vote itself, how many re Remainers, um, I have to be careful, Once. Remainers, um, actually use the turnout argument to yes. the, the vast majority of people in the UK did not vote for Brexit. But that's this, a common argument, isn't it? This is very clearly about young people. And Shut up and answer the question! It's okay for you to get elected as student uni president if only half the fucking students can be bothered to get out of bed to go and vote. That's okay, that's legitimate. But if uh, 25 or 40 or 15 or 16 or 18% of the electorate didn't vote in the referendum, the result is somehow illegitimate. Jesus.
people and 70% of 18 to 24 year olds want to remain. These people, they even acknowledge in the letter that they respected the initial, but this is a vote, but this is a very different question that they're asking. Tom, you're shaking your head there. I, I really don't think anyone buys this at all. It's such a transparent attempt, attempt to try and overturn the last referendum, which happened less than two years ago. I mean, it, this isn't anywhere close to a million students demanding this. This is around 100 people from the NUS who've got together and are very upset that the referendum didn't go the way that they wanted it to go and so they want to have another go and if if this one goes the way that they don't want it to go they'll want to have another one and another one and another one it's getting to the point of of farcical really good man tom it is farcical but it ain't going to happen final word on brexit for this sunday view the sunday telegraph front page the headline is dozen ministers deserve to me on customs now this is what's going to happen the government is going to be destroyed by this division along the lines of some of them want some sort of a custom arrangement tailored for the UK, some sort of arrangement for the UK to stay in the customs union, some kind of some sort of bespoke arrangement. Uh, they keep blaming problems with the Northern Ireland border and the peace process and all of that. So May, of course, has given into it. Philip Hammond, a lot of the front bench are complete remainers anyway. And on the other side, you have Johnson, you have Michael Gove, you have people like Jacob Rees-Monk. This could destroy the government, right? Fair enough. But we, we don't care too much about governments anyway. So the Telegraph is reporting that about a dozen members of May's cabinet are basically lining up to revolt and to block her plans for this bespoke customs partnership with the European Union. This is a big story. It's how Brexit is going to completely unravel. I said from day one there wouldn't be a Brexit, and, and, and I did basically outline... I've been wrong so much over the years, I've got to take some credit. It's not that I said it wouldn't happen. It's I, 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 I outlined how it would be destroyed, and this is how it's happening. Anyway, the last word on this uh, from uh, Chloe Westley. Chloe is the campaign's director with the Taxpayers' Alliance, and she spoke on the Mar show today. There's a story on the front page of the Telegraph about uh, ministers taking issue with this new customs partnership. Um, and the reason why they're taking issue is because this new customs partnership would inhibit the UK's ability to sign trade deals with other countries. It's very difficult to see how it differs all that much from customs union memberships. There's a, there's a big um, discussion about this. So people like you on the right of politics, you work for the Taxpayers' Alliance, are basically saying, we want to cut free properly. We don't want to well, halfway exactly. out. Exactly. They're huge opportunities. I mean, if we leave the customs union, we can lower tariffs on food, which would lower the cost of food by about, it's estimated, 17%. So there are huge opportunities for people. Good stuff. And that's, that, that's, that's, that's the fact of it, right? So there's no point in repeating that. You heard what she had to say. 18 and a half minutes to the top of the air. Another very quick break back. And then we're going to talk about Israel for a little bit. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today.
Yeah, it's not been putting too many articles on richieallen.co.uk over the last week or so. I did have the week off, um, but there will be some interesting and thought-provoking pieces going up there this coming week. Do stay in touch with richieallen.co.uk. Last newspaper will do Sunday Mirror. Front page says Crystal Mess in Home Office Headquarters. The Sunday Mirror reports today that a Class A drug has been discovered in the toilets of the Home Office. The paper says police were called to the government department 10 days ago after crystal meth was twice found in bathrooms. Who reported it? He or she who dealt it? He or she who smelt it, I should say, probably dealt it. Would you know what crystal meth is if you saw it? If you saw some, I don't know, is it flaky? Is it, is it, is it like little bits of rock? Is it? I, don't, I genuinely don't know. I watched Breaking Bad. I don't know how accurate that was. Maybe it was. Would you recognise it? Anyway, if that is the least of the crimes committed at the Home Office, we wouldn't have much to worry about. But it it isn't the least of the crimes committed at the Home Office. Anyway, that's the Sunday Mirror. Now, tomorrow's a big day, uh, and this week is a big week. The Independent reports, workmen have been toiling around the clock in preparation for Mondays, that's tomorrow, grand opening ceremony of the new US Embassy in Jerusalem. Rooms have been renovated, flowers planted in the design of the US flag, Old Glory, and the seal of the US Embassy has gone up, blah, blah, blah. Security around the building has been upgraded. Um, President Trump says this costs about 400,000 US dollars. There's been 14 months of preparations the consulate will be inaugurated to huge fanfare, writes The Independent, with 800 guests attending and a video address by Trump will be beamed live around the world. Do we still talk like that? It'll be beamed live around the world. It's not like Elvis in Hawaii, is it? Jesus. Anyway, timed to coincide with the 70th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel the illegitimate, completely illegal state of Israel, by the way. The opening has been hailed as the beginning of a new quarter in Arnona, South Jerusalem, for embassies from countries around the world that will spring up there. Trump, of course, announced this back in December. It was greeted with shock and horror amongst both allies and critics because of the contested status of Jerusalem. The Palestinians, of course, want their own country with a capital in East Jerusalem, which Israel stole uh, from Jordanian control in 1967. So there you go. It's a big week, right? Um, The Americans are very confident. According to the papers today, they have changed the official Israeli embassy... Excuse me. They have changed the official US embassy in Israel Twitter name. So it used to be at US Embassy Tel Aviv... It's now at U.S. Embassy Jerusalem. The Sky News interviewed a guy called Hen Mazig this morning. They roll this guy out all the time. He's an Israeli writer and formerly, don't laugh, formerly Israeli Defence Force humanitarian officer. There's an oxymoron if you ever wanted one. IDF humanitarian. Please. Anyway, here's the lead into the interview from Sky News presenter Gillian Joseph. Tomorrow will be a hugely symbolic day in Jerusalem as the US government officially opens its new embassy there. Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner will be in attendance at the event, which will also mark Jerusalem Day, a commemoration of the capture of East Jerusalem during the Six-Day War in 1967. Well, the decision by Mr. Trump to move the embassy from Tel Aviv has sparked protests from Palestinians and criticism from the international community, who believe that the decision to create a fatal could create a fatal roadblock in any future efforts to revive the peace process. Well, let's speak now to Israeli writer and former humanitarian officer for the Israeli Defense Force, Hen Mazik. He's in Tel Aviv for us. Good morning to you. Um, the UN has condemned uh, what it's describing. Um, as an excessive use of force against Palestinians at the moment. How would you respond to that? Now, we've described Sky News on this programme before as a carnival of cack or a carnival of cack poo 
wait till you hear the lies out of this guy's mouth. They have no limit. Tomorrow will be a hugely symbolic day in Jerusalem as the US government officially opens its new embassy there. Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner... Have I just played the same clip again yet? I should be playing the guy's response, shouldn't I? Here's the guy's response. So she asked him to respond to UN criticism. Right, here we go. Uh, Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, And congratulations to Neta that won the Eurovision yesterday. It's a big day here. And Oh, you had to get that in. Congratulations to Neta, who won the Eurovision yesterday. With the worst song ever! In the history of music. The following week is going to be very big in Israel. Um, I think that the situation right now is very delicate as uh, Israel is, uh, you know, fa- uh, facing uh, Iran and Hezbollah in the north. We're facing 10,000s of protesters in the border with Gaza where uh, they want to break down the fence and uh, um, uh, sending Molotov, throwing Molotov cocktails, um, burning kites in the air, um, saying uh, one quote that uh, leader in Hamas said that. Uh, as soon as they would break the fence, they would break down or take out the hearts of Palestine of Israelis. Um, so uh, Israeli citizens are uh, are, are worried. Um, um, but with that being said, I think it's a, it's a very important week for us here. Yeah, comical Ali, this guy, the minister for the most ridiculous propaganda. That's what they should give him. The, the title they should give him: the minister for bullshit. What an idiot, Hen Mazik. Lie after lie after lie. Tens of thousands of Palestinians trying to break through, throwing Molotov cocktails, burning kites. We're all terrified here. And we have Iran and Hezbollah up there, to the left, over there. We're unbelievable. As you heard, he didn't answer her original question, which was to respond to the UN criticism of the treatment of Palestinians. So his next question, her next question, I should say, should be to repeat that and insist he answers it. So what you got was a load of waffle there, a load of bullshit about how the Israelis are the victims. She should come back with, with respect, Mr. Mazig, I asked you to respond to claims by the United Nations that the treatment of Palestinians is unacceptable. But of course she doesn't ask him that, she asks him this. And it does seem as though it will be the the, the perfect storm on Monday. We've got the Palestinians saying that they will uh, storm uh, the divisive border uh, and will move across. There have been many warnings of much increased violence. We know that one person has already lost their lives in those protests. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, I'm thinking of any other country that will have to face such, um, you know, 10,000 protesters that are trying to break through its border, um, throwing mud. She just mentioned about the Palestinian loss of life. She said one person was killed. Nonsense. There were dozens killed. Dozens, right? Not one person. And rather than respond to that, he talks about how we're living in fear because there are 10,000 Palestinians at the border threatening to come through. It's terrifying. It's all so fucking terrifying, he says. Molotov cocktails, trying to get... Molotov cocktails again. Get that in again, yeah. Get to Israeli civilians and cities on the other side. Um, Some statement that we hear from Gaza, from uh, the Palestinians that came to defense uh, is that they would, uh, they just want to break through to get to Israelis, to get to Israeli civilians. It's an unbearable situation to be in. I think that the IDF is doing, the Israeli Defense Force is doing all this. If it's an unbearable position to be in, why doesn't Israel fuck off? Because it doesn't belong there. There's no right to be there. Israelis have no right to be there, historically. Not then, not now. So if it's so unbearable, if it's so terrifying because of these lunatic Arabs on the other side of the fence who can't wait to get at Israeli people, just leave then. After all, it is their country. Maybe? Just the thought. Well, it's can to, uh, to stop them, to, uh, uh, to contain the demonstrations that are turning very violent. And it's something that uh, uh, we're trying to deal with uh, uh, in the best way. But, you know, with, uh, with the leadership of Hamas in Gaza calling for civilians to, to kill themselves and, and, and to, uh, to become... Oh, the same old propaganda. If you fertilise that, if you, put <laughs> if you dried that one out, you could fertilise the lawn with it. Hamas is telling them to commit suicide and kill us all and... Oh, what are we going to do? And defences and everything. And she doesn't interrupt the word of it. Not a bit of it. Just let him carry on with his nonsense propaganda. Martyrs, that's something that uh, is always a uh, difficult and challenge. Um, how do you stop it uh, without hurting anyone when people throw in Molotov cocktails and bombs Molotov over cocktail. uh, to, to defence to the border with Israel? Do you have any sympathy at all for the Palestinians there? Of course he doesn't. Will you hear this answer? Palestinians, they're commemorating, particularly on Tuesday, um, them being moved forcibly from their uh, property when the, the state of Israel was created. Do you have any sympathy at all for them? 
Oh, definitely. I have sympathy. I mean, I'm a son of two refugees. My my dad came to Israel from North Africa. My mom came to Israel from Iraq. Both of them were part of 850,000 Jewish refugees that were expelled from the Middle East and everything was stolen Jesus. from them. A grateful great founder was uh, was killed in Iraq. I mean, there's refugees created all over the world and, and my family is a part of them. Uh, most of Israel is countries of, a country of refugees that were expelled. What an answer. He's asked about sympathy for the Palestinians and he turns it around about how, not about how the Palestinians feel and are being treated, but into the usual Israeli shtick. We're the victims. We were robbed. We had to flee. We're the refugees. Yeah. And, and you're going to get that all day today on, U on UK and US television news programmes. You're going to get it tomorrow. You're going to get it the day after. Wednesday, you're not going to hear the other side of it at all. Wonderful, isn't it? Uh, they put out idiots like that to talk about Molotov cocktails. And she says to him, one Palestinian was killed. Dozens were killed. Children were shot through the hearts by IDF uh, snipers on the right of return protest days. Not a peep from the UK or the US media about that. Just this propaganda bullshit. And you know what's palpable when you watch these interviews? It's palpable how terribly nervous the presenters are. They are shitting themselves. They really are, these news presenters. They do not want to cross over an invisible line that's right there on their, in their studio, on their mixing desk. They are not allowed to ask or to even hint at the kidnapping of children the murder of innocent Palestinians, women dying in childbirth at checkpoints. Can't speak about that. So she's hesitant, Gillian Joseph. What do I say? What do I say? Every fibre of her being is saying, jump in there and argue with the bastard. But no, no, can't happen. Keep quiet. And just get past the interview and then move on to safer ground. That's the way it is. Four minutes to the top of the hour. That's pretty much it for Sunday View today. Thank you um, for listening to this Sunday View. Uh, Jean Ann is just saying there, it's a good point that they are tongue-tied, these presenters. And if you do catch that interview on Sky News' YouTube channel, when they put it up later on, you'll see that Jean Ann is spot on. Tongue-tied is a perfect uh, description of how these presenters carry on. Terrified. Terrified. She didn't press them. Listen, the UN are saying that you're committing crimes against humanity. Answer that. Stop with the Molotov cocktails bullshit there, man. Why are you killing Palestinian children? Why are you doing that? And isn't it true that you've got no legitimate reason to be there? Not historically. Not biblically. There's nothing connecting your ridiculous religion to that region, ever. Ever, historically, you've got no ethnic ties to the land. Right? The Sykes-Peacock Agreement and the illegal Balfour Declaration gave you a home and a land you didn't belong in. End of fucking story. Argue that with him. Let him answer that. Well, that's anti-Semitism, isn't it? If you say the Jews don't have a right to be there, well, that's anti-Semitic. No, it isn't. It's historic fact. Anyway... That's it. Thanks for listening to me. Got a great show lined up for you tomorrow, Monday. Uh, the amazing Dean Henderson will be back with me tomorrow and he's going to give us a, a very interesting presentation on the City of London. You don't want to miss that Monday show live at 7pm UK time. Going to leave you with some Bill Withers on this fine day. On this lovely day. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Good luck to Alan Bristow there in hospital in Grimsby. This is for you, Alan. Keep your, keep your chin up, pal. All the best for now. See you tomorrow. Bye. Enjoy your Sunday. Bye now.